Doctor Who appeared on our TV screens for the first time. There had never been anything quite like it. Back then, no one could have guessed this strange and often terrifying new adventure show about a mysterious time traveller in a blue box would still be with us more than half a century later. Today, millions of viewers around the world follow the Doctor's adventures in space and time. The show connects generations of fans and brings families together like nothing else on TV. Science has been part of the creative DNA of Doctor Who since the beginning. Scientific ideas have often provided inspiration for its characters, gadgets and stories. The show was originally intended to be partly educational viewing. Two of its earliest companions, Ian and Barbara, were science and history teachers. The first Doctor was portrayed as a lone scientist figure, an eccentric inventor and explorer. Here was an outsider who did things their own way and didn't have much time for professionals and authority figures, something that hasn't changed very much in the years. Yes. Well, I say to myself, I think that's a remarkably efficient piece of work. This is going to be fun. Co-creator Sidney Newman was very keen on the serial being a celebration of modern science. He was also very clear that he didn't want any bug-eyed monsters. But as you will discover in this exhibition, Doctor Who quickly became so much more. It took us on trips across the cosmos and introduced us to extraordinary life forms. Because just like scientific thinking, this is a show with limitless curiosity. Here you'll explore the science that's so often the launch pad for Doctor Who's stories. You can find out more about time travel, sonic screwdrivers, and black holes, and more. Oh, and monsters. You'll definitely be meeting a few of those. So be ready. Remember. Don't. I'll be checking in on you again later, so until then, enjoy your exploration of one of the most iconic TV shows in the world, and of course, the science that helps inspire it. Well, the laws of physics as we understand them today actually do allow for time travel into the future. What you really need to do is slow time down for the person or the object who's going into the future. You slow that time down relative to everything else. And there are ways of doing that. You can have either intense gravitational fields, such as produced by a massive uh, object like a supermassive star, or you move at fast relative speed. So what happens is that you can go close to that planet and wait there for a while. Time is running slowly for you relative to everything that you else. And then when you come back to normal space, they've gone way far into the future and you are in the future. You have time travel to the future. Alternatively, you can get onto a rocket ship and go at super fast speeds, as fast as you can, close to the speed of light. Again, time will travel much more slowly for you everyone else is going into the future faster, so that when you come back to normal space where you began, you're in the future. Traveling backwards in time, as far as we understand it, is fraught with difficulty. First, it's, it's hard to know how to actually engineer it. So, you might imagine you could do something with time involving gravity,
gravity or speed uh, that you can do to go into the future, but there's no simple way of doing it that sends you backwards in time. You really have to run time backwards now, not to slow it down. So that's a difficulty. There are equations, there are solutions of uh, the equations of space and time that suggest ways of doing it, and we create things called closed time-like loops. And that would be mechanisms by which you, uh, again, involving some strange object now that has exotic energy associated with it, uh, allows you to loop around it and go backwards in time. But we don't really know if those theoretical possibilities actually are allowed. They run you into paradoxes, and the universe doesn't like paradoxes. It seems to protect itself from nonsense. So the paradoxes involving going back and perhaps stopping yourself from making the time machine that sent you back in the first place, uh, those need to be resolved somehow. We don't know if that's possible yet. So right now, uh, it's still an open question. To understand what a black hole really is, you need to appreciate that the light is affected by gravity as well as mass evolving. So what happens is that you have a lot of mass and energy in some region of space, and it's difficult for things to escape from gravitational flow. But it also becomes difficult, if there's enough of it, for light to escape as well. And there's a limit at which there's so much mass and energy in that region of space that even light can't escape. So now the object is not emitting light anymore, so the term black hole is more. What actually happens is that it becomes, in some sense, uh, it's not really visual, whatever matter or the light is that we should be light for. Everything we know in the universe can be contained by the black hole. One of the wonderful things that's been happening in the last few decades is that our detection techniques, telescopes of various lines, and uh, other ways of measuring astronomical objects, have been telling us that there's certain kinds of regions of space that have these incredibly dense uh, regions of matter energy. So even if we can't see them because light's not coming directly from them, we know they're there because we can measure their effects on things around them. And so that's been telling us that the only candidates that we know of that can fit the bill for those observations are black holes. Even more dramatically, a long, uh, a long ago prediction of Einstein's equations was that actually black holes themselves would create a sort of ringing ripples in space and time called gravitational waves. We've now been able to detect all of those gravitational waves because there are new kinds of detectors called gravitational wave observatories that can see from the inside of black holes directly. So this is hugely exciting and there's extra confirmation that black holes are a real thing without the other ones. Black hole is actually the bending and stretching of space and time. In fact, any massive object in this black hole is extremely So extreme that it can actually distort the object from near, uh, near enough to the black hole. The space uh, distortion will reduce stretching and the distortion of the materials of the object falling in as well. Or if you went too close to a compact enough black hole, your spaceship will start getting uh, distorted as well. It's also slowing down time distortion compared to everyone else. And that will be the beginning of the sorts of extreme forces you would experience when it is And so space and time are doing extraordinary things in the neighborhood of the black hole due to its extreme black hole. Theoretically, black holes are a, are a mystery because they produce this uh, one-way barrier, this, this place where uh, things go in but don't seem to come out. And the rest of the physics doesn't like that. So the tension between 
uh, gravitational uh, physics of black holes, like, for example, the laws of quantum physics that seem to govern everything else, are uh, telling us that there's something new to learn about the universe, and, and black holes are making it unavoidable. There's one way barrier to the event horizon that uh, point of no return, the past which things go forward and come back on. There's nothing else in physics like that. And in fact, the rest of the laws of physics, the quantum doesn't really like that. Things find ways of coming back out. So, in our uh, uh, theoretical observation of how things work, we're trying to understand it all together, black hole physics and quantum physics. And it seems inevitable that there's new phenomena, uh, most famously, uh, Hawking rays. Uh, discovered by Stephen Hawking, the idea that the nature of the vacuum of space, which is quantum near the small wave barrier, will produce a quantum effect that looks like a black hole is radiating. So, this gravitational effect produces something very strange, which may be detectable and may actually tell us how space time has so evolved in certain quantum mechanical circumstances. Now, that is actually extremely important from the very early universe as well, where we believe that gravity and quantum mechanics were operating almost on equal terms. And so, whatever we learn about black holes and how they really operate, even in normal space here, may teach us things about the very early universe and how the entire universe came to be from its very early stage. So, we're still learning a lot from both real and pure natural qualities and how you express it. One of the wonderful things that happened in the history of black holes was the realization that they are the most powerful engines we know of to produce the energy. There were these bright kinds of sources and possible ways of which produced huge amounts of radiative energy. So, okay, what sources uh, could, could, could produce them? Ordinary stellar burning doesn't even come close to the sort of energy that So, what we realized was that actually we should have a cycle of rapidly rotating black holes. And the rotation of those black holes produce a dynamo effect swirl together lots of charged particles and other kinds of particles, and then they produce radiation, which you have to spread in the sun. So you might imagine that one day an advanced civilization might take advantage of these sources. Perhaps they would engineer massive means of extracting that energy from a black hole. I don't know what they use all of that energy for, because that's a huge amount of energy, but in some advanced civilization, perhaps, there's hope for it. It's simply fun to imagine what that might be. Black holes are fascinating things because there's this door that we don't know what's on the sun side. Going behind the event horizon is something that we'd love to. Do either theoretically or with a real experiment. Of course, the nature of the one point in the horizon is that it doesn't seem like there's something back. So that means that in some ways, even more time to think about what's going on behind the horizon. There's a destruction of the void, perhaps it's a gateway to some of the different kind of space and time, perhaps a different universe. This part of the expression. Life. There are all sorts of theoretical mechanisms that have been shown in the of black holes. The natural world is direct, but it would be nice to one day find out. Exterminate all humans on level 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Welcome back. Enjoying it so far? By now you've had a peek inside the wonders of our targets and had a chance to explore. Bit of the cosmos. Time to get your feet back. In this part of the exhibition, we'll discover more about life science here on Earth and the role it has played in shaping Dr. Brown. The natural world is an endless source of inspiration for the writers and scientists. Science has shown us that nature can be every bit as weird and wonderful as our wildest sci-fi Scientific understanding about is constantly evolving. New 
new technologies, how to study things in ways that were impossible. Even a decade back, we are discovering more about natural science everywhere. Who knows what fresh discoveries will provide the spark for creating new stories and characters of the Doctor in the years ahead. The Doctor's travels have taken us to many exotic planets, world vast deserts, acid oceans, and mountains made of diamonds. Carnivorous forests, skies filled with flying fish, and even a few guys that look suspiciously like But there's still so much we don't know about our own planet. Did you know that more people have walked on the moon than have traveled to the deepest parts of the ocean? Science is always asking questions, and there's one big question that's always been at heart who Some scientists think our solar system may hold evidence of simple single cell life. Could there be something? After all, there are 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and a million sun like stars within a thousand light years of Earth. Somewhere, conditions may be just right for intelligent life. Perhaps one day we'll discover that we're not alone.
machinery. But what's the real world? In machinery or technological developments for medicine? So, I mean, that, that theme in Doctor Who or cybernetics <laughs> and, and some of the is quite fascinating. There's that idea that if you allow technology to ingress too far, <laughs> but actually, that idea of bonding, engineering, and technology with an existing way and a great deal of attention to Actually, 
two weeks we're full of sort of seven a crew of seven of being in a room the size of the small bathroom in the house and we work for so you know your work on my bacteria on go into a space car code every single sentence goes out. So it is an interesting thing how much now I have the it's very fascinating that humans can exist in, in extreme environments like space. What I also find really amazing is that life can exist in extreme environments. Bottom of the ocean is probably the, one of the most hostile environments on Earth, and you find life there. It's interesting that very few people have ever been there, unlike up in space. So do you think the future of how people will work under the oceans, even in the places might parallel what you've been learning about space? One of the really interesting things about extreme forests, you know, and in Doctor Who, what, what you see is you these adventurers traveling everywhere through, throughout the universe and throughout time. But when you actually look at all of the range of conditions of human life, so if you stand on the surface of the planet, unsupported, you get about nine kilometers of vertical ocean around the side of the planet, and you can only just get go there, and not for a long time, that's a penalty. You're getting into the ocean, after about 10 meters of your breathing air, you start to get into trouble, and your physiology starts to change. And you cannot go very far into any desert, or very far into the polar extreme, before you are in trouble. So, the way we think of the Earth as, as a biosphere, and, and one, of, one of my colleagues said it's wrong, the idea of a sphere, like a smear, sort of smeared across the face of the planet, it's about five or seven kilometers thick. And it gives you an appreciation of just how fragile and how beautiful it is, how fragile. It's quite interesting, given your background and experience, the parallels between life support systems in spacecraft and life support systems in the Tizen Canyon. Um, the TARDIS seems to be incredibly large, and we never see life support systems. So, what's it really like in a spacecraft? <laughs> It's always like a cruel joke played by, by the people who created Doctor Who that the TARDIS is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside because that is the opposite of what spacecraft are like. And, and you realise that everything that you see on television of human spaceflight is shot in a very wide angle lens. And I've been inside a number of these vehicles, they are tiny. I mean, I mean I'm talking telephone box. <laughs> Real telephone box tiny as, as opposed to Doctor Who telephone box. But they're tiny inside. They have to be, um, and, and so yeah, it's kind of. I think I think it's a sort of cruel joke. Yeah, so, so the astronauts don't have lots of space to dig around. They might be on the space station, but space station is pretty pretty big. Um, space shuttle was tiny, and the capsules that they went to the moon in and the first orbit of the Earth are tiny enough that the things are coming. You know how long I've been waiting for company. I suppose you'll do, but please don't crowd me. Yes, I'm sure you're positively awestruck. It's me, Lady Cassandra, the last pure human. But please, no autographs. Don't even ask. It's undignified. Just admire how marvelously youthful and thin I am. I admit, I wasn't always so striking. Long ago, I was like you, all lumps and bumps and curves and cheapos. Just another face in the crowd. Back when I knew crowds. These days, I find myself keeping more exclusive company. Still, that's the price you pay for perfection. And I paid the finest surgeons. 708 operations, procedures, almost pain-free. And I've never looked back since. How can I without a neck? <laughs> oh no, don't. I should stop. I might get laughed at hands. Well, it takes work to look this good. There's still a tiny trace of chin that could do the smoothing out, I think. And my blood needs bleaching. Honestly, being flawless is so exhausting. 